everyone. My name is Borisov Gerasimov, and I'm uh, the communications and advocacy coordinator at the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women. This year, GetW, together with Sharmila Parmanant, a PhD student in gender studies at the University of Cambridge, is holding a series of conversations uh, with advocates and practitioners around the world. Um, uh, where we ask them to uh, reflect and evaluate on the 20th anniversary of the uh, UN Protocol Against Human Trafficking or the so-called Palermo Protocol. So today we are joined by Martina Vandenberg from the Human uh, Trafficking Legal Center in the United States. Hi Martina and thank you Hi, for, uh, for agreeing to speak with us. Thanks for joining us Martina. Maybe we can start with you telling us a bit about yourself, your professional journey, and the Human Trafficking Legal Center. So my name is Martina Vandenberg. I'm the president and founder of the Human Trafficking Legal Center. We're based in Washington, DC, but we work both nationally and internationally. And before founding the Human Trafficking Legal Center, long, long ago, around the time of Palermo negotiations, I was at Human Rights Watch. And I served as the Women's Rights Division researcher for Europe and Central Asia. And so for Human Rights Watch, my job was essentially documenting trafficking in persons um, throughout the Balkans and the former Soviet Union. And that research propelled me to participate in the negotiations in Vienna for Palermo, and also to work on the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which passed at about the same time in 2000. So I've worked on trafficking for more than 20 years. I'm amazed to say. And I've worked on trafficking in, in multiple parts of the world. So as I mentioned in the Europe and Central Asia region, but then I also lived in Israel and worked for a local NGO in Israel, the Israel Women's Network, and documented trafficking of women for forced prostitution into Israel uh, back in the 90s. So I've been working on trafficking for a long time, long enough to see trends and long enough to see where where things have gone wrong. So what is your overall assessment of the anti-trafficking framework and its development in these past 20 years? And our video series is to evaluate the trafficking protocol. Uh, and if you wish, you can speak about that or about the TVPA, um, the US uh, federal law on trafficking, which as you said, was adopted around the same time. Um, and you can also reflect if there is any difference in the two, if you wish. There's a huge difference between Palermo and the TVPA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, partly because we can amend the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, right? And I think all of us who've worked on this for so long realize that Palermo needs amendment as well. We need to fundamentally reassess the entire framework that we adopted with tremendous optimism and goodwill and good faith more than 20 years ago. But I, I think the power to amend the Trafficking Victims Protection Act has kept it relevant and growing. And let me just give you one example. So Palermo's central theme, and if you read, uh, you know, if, if you read the, the, the treaty, if you read the agreement, clearly the central theme is criminalization, right? The, the mechanism, the vehicle to combat human trafficking adopted in the Palermo Protocol is a criminal justice model. And that indeed was the same model adopted in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act when we started in 99, 2000. There was a sense that we simply could prosecute human trafficking out of existence or at least deter traffickers. Fast forward 20 years, I think what we've discovered is that no matter how much pushing, no matter how much doubling down there is, no matter how much pressure there is for countries to engage in this sort of criminal justice prosecution model, we are not gonna prosecute our way out of human trafficking. And in fact, those prosecutions do harm to trafficking victims and trafficking survivors. The question now is how do we change that framework to reflect the reality on the ground as it actually exists? I mean, the United States is a perfect example because the criminal justice model in the United States has also been extremely disappointing, particularly for victims of forced labor. So in the United States in 2019, according to the US government's own statistics, 
there were 12 prosecutions for forced labor in the entire country, 12 at the federal level. That's it. The interesting thing that we did with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act and all of the subsequent reauthorizations is that we created a private right of action. So we created the possibility for trafficking victims to bring their own cases in the federal courts against the traffickers and also against third parties who benefit financially from the trafficking. What that meant was trafficking victims could bring their own case using exactly the same set of criminal laws that the criminal prosecutors rely on, but they could bring their cases with their own sort of decision-making in place about whether to proceed and whether to settle. Obviously these cases don't put anyone in prison. These cases are all about compensation and sometimes about equitable remedies, sometimes about sort of longer term policy remedies, but the survivor controls the case and the survivor determines how to push, how to proceed. And the pro bono lawyers, we work only with uh, lawyers who do these cases pro bono, the pro bono lawyers listen to the trafficking survivor who's actually setting the, setting the agenda in the case, just looking at forced labor cases. In 2019, there were 12 federal prosecutions. In the same year, there were 38 civil cases in the United States brought by survivors themselves. That's remarkable because that means that trafficking survivors are bringing three times the number of cases that the government itself is bringing. Those cases brought by survivors are cases generally that weren't prosecuted. We've taken the lessons of Palermo. Palermo has very soft law, very kind of recommendation oriented law that survivors may, if possible, should, um, although should is even too strong a word, have access to remedies and have access to compensation. But those parts of Palermo are just too mushy. They're too soft. And what we see is when, when you actually move the needle a little bit to allow survivors to have more of a role in determining what justice means to, to them and for them, um, you can actually get a decent, a decent outcome that does less harm to survivors. So it seems like the legal infrastructure is in place, technically, for survivors to take control of their own case, right? For survivor-driven um, justice. What are the common obstacles you encounter then in people making use of this legal remedy? It puts so much of the onus on the survivor, right? It really it makes it their their responsibility, and it's confusing and it's difficult and the system, particularly for foreign born survivors here in the United States, the system is completely kind of incomprehensible, unfortunately. And so, and, and even, for, even for US citizen survivors, the legal system is confusing and difficult to navigate. So Shamarla, I would say one of the big difficulties is number one, finding a lawyer, right? That's exactly why I created the Human Trafficking Legal Center, was to connect trafficking survivors with pro bono lawyers who can represent them in cases for free and who would be trained and have expertise on these kinds of cases. Because, you know, the law only passed in 2003. So we're only looking at 17 years. So over the last 17 years, the lawyers who work in this field in the United States have essentially built a body of law from scratch, right? We've been building jurisprudence from scratch in the civil sector. So for, for survivors, the, the first challenge is just finding a lawyer. The second challenge I think is, is feeling safe enough to bring a case. And over the last four years, that has been particularly problematic because the Trump administration has undermined so many protections for trafficking survivors. And in the immigration system, where we really rely on T visas, so visas created by the Trafficking Victims Protection Act to protect trafficking victims who are here in the United States and allow them to remain in the United States. The Trump administration has undermined that system. It's been death by a thousand paper cuts, actually more like a million paper cuts because they've made so many changes in the system that have, that have harmed trafficking victims in different ways. So first off is you know just feeling safe and feeling secure enough to raise your hand and say yes I want to go to court and yes I want to seek justice um, 
we, you know, we're trying to make it as accessible and as easy as possible, but there are definitely still challenges for survivors seeking compensation. Can you tell us more about what the Human Trafficking Legal Center does? You, you mentioned you connect survivors to pro bono lawyers. So we basically have trained about 4,000 pro bono lawyers in the United States to represent trafficking survivors. And you know, when I started this work back uh, in 2011, 2012, working full-time on trafficking, I thought that all of our work would be civil litigation. And so the trainings that I did in the beginning focused entirely on civil litigation. And then I think we all realized that trafficking survivors don't just have one legal need, they have an entire buffet of legal needs. And so we started to do much more work on immigration. We started to do work on tax issues for trafficking survivors who are confronting tax issues because of crimes their traffickers committed. So we started sort of expanding the array of pro bono services that the lawyers that we trained would, would do. So the referrals and training are sort of core to the, to the mission. But in addition, we have databases of every single trafficking case brought in the United States criminally since 2009 and on the civil side since 2003, the first year that those cases became possible. And so we use those databases to sort of mine the case law to see what's going wrong and to identify trends that you can't see when you're deep in the trench, but you can actually see when you're 50,000 feet above the trench. And you know, we've, we've identified things that I think had gone unnoticed. We, we identified the trafficking of people with disabilities because we started to see cases pop up in the data sets of trafficking of people with disabilities, particularly intellectual disabilities, both forced labor and sex trafficking. Um, we, we identified uh, the theft of public benefits as one of the features of that trafficking. And we, we also identified a very troubling trend of prosecutors using material witness warrants to arrest trafficking victims and force them to testify. And so, you know, I used to work at Human Rights Watch. And so my, uh, my sort of norm is to then put all of this out publicly and report on this. So we've done reports on the misuse of material witness warrants to imprison trafficking victims. And we've also done reports on the failure of the US government to award mandatory restitution to victims in criminal cases because the, the law says, and it's completely clear, that trafficking victims have the right to receive criminal restitution in criminal cases. And that restitution is an amount of money that simply should make them whole. If it's a forced labor cases, it's back wages. If it's a sex trafficking case, it's whatever the trafficker earned. And so you should see mandatory restitution in 100% of cases that end in conviction or a plea deal. And what we discovered is that there was restitution actually in 27% of those cases, which is highly problematic. It means that you know, the law, which is written beautifully about victims' rights and victim restitution, is not being implemented or enforced. So because we don't take any US government money, or frankly, any government money at all, we're able to publish these findings without fear of retaliation. And I mean, that's another thing I learned in Human Rights Watch is, is just to be careful and not to um, allow funding to muzzle the critique that you need to make public. So we've written all of these reports and worked a lot on sort of improving policy and changing law. One of the changes that, that we made, um, Borislav, in the law is that at one point, the US government was actually forfeiting assets from traffickers in criminal cases, forfeiting the assets, and then the assets would go to the treasury and the restitution would never be paid. And so we changed the law so that if assets are forfeited, they have to first go to restitution. And then after that, they can go to the treasury if there are no victims who are in line to be, to be compensated in, a, in the criminal case. So that's, so the, the research and writing is is another piece um, and the data mining is another piece and then you know we do a lot of work to try and shape the law right i mean we have to be very strategic in how the law develops and so a lot of our work is also doing amicus briefs a friend of the court briefs in cases where we think that there's an important legal issue at stake 
we've done amicus briefs in cases against private detention centers holding immigrant detainees allegedly in forced labor and forcing them to work in the detention centers. We just did an amicus brief in the Supreme Court of the United States on behalf of children from Mali allegedly trafficked into Cote d'Ivoire to work in child slavery on the plantations, the cocoa plantations in, in Cote d'Ivoire. So there's, a, there's an important piece of, of making sure that the body of case law is, is developing properly and, and doing course corrections when, when, things aren't going, when things aren't going well. I had a quick question actually. Do you also work with domestic victims? We do, although less frequently. I was just yeah. gonna ask if there's a difference in the profiles or like in the vulnerabilities, I suppose, in how they navigate the system. So that's an excellent question. I mean, part of the reason why we traditionally have worked only with foreign born survivors is because we offer immigration services. And so in, traditionally the, the organizations that refer to us, refer, refer survivors to us, are referring people who need immigration services. We also have developed over the years, a specialization in representing victims of trafficking held in domestic servitude by diplomats which is a pretty tricky and complicated area of the law. And so having that expertise in diplomatic law means that a lot of the people who come to us are people who are foreign born domestic workers trafficked into the United States for forced labor in the homes of diplomats or international organization employees. So their, their needs, you know, if you talk to those survivors, they generally have two priorities. One is, immigration, so regularization of their immigration status so they don't have to be terrified they're going to be deported. And then the second, particularly in the domestic servitude cases, is generally compensation. You know, they're very, very concerned about sending money home to their families. The entire reason that they migrated in the first place is because oftentimes they're the breadwinner for the entire family. And so, you know, I just think of dealing with these two issues of, of immigration and money <laughs> are really kind of the two most important items to, to confront. You know, there's all the services, housing, psychological counseling, other forms of support, public benefits. Those, those are, you know, incredibly important, but the kind of fundamental things that the survivors are concerned about are, are really those, those two. Um, the, 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 the US citizen survivors tend to have a different profile because the US citizen survivors actually tend more frequently to tra be trafficked into uh, forced prostitution or child commercial sexual exploitation. And so sex trafficking cases traditionally have not gone civil. They have been prosecuted. And when I talk to trafficking survivors, um, sex trafficking survivors in the past, they used to say, you know, I don't wanna go back to court. I've done that. I have no interest in going through that again. And all I want is for someone to collect the restitution that was ordered for me, right? Because the restitution even when ordered wasn't being collected by the prosecutors. So they, they didn't wanna go back to court. Because of a change in the law, allowing trafficking survivors to sue third parties who benefit financially, there has been a massive shift in who's bringing civil cases. So I mentioned in 2019 that there were 38 civil cases filed on behalf of forced labor survivors. In that same year, for the first time ever, the number of sex trafficking civil cases for damages exceeded the number of forced labor cases. That's a huge shift. That was, a, from my perspective, a kind of tsunami because the reason that those sex trafficking survivors were now bringing lawsuits in civil courts on, on sex trafficking allegations was because they started suing hotels, right? So they're no longer suing the trafficker directly, they're suing hotels for financially benefiting. And now we're starting to see prosecutions of hotel owners for financially benefiting for trafficking, even criminal prosecutions, we've seen two so far. You mentioned um, that survivors need to get the restitution awarded to them themselves and this is something i've also heard from europe uh, where this is referred to as compensation more often but also that very often survivors even when the court orders compensation which is not 
in all cases, just like in the US, um, survivors actually don't get any of it. And sometimes they are responsible for collecting it themselves. And so I was wondering, is this working in the US? Um, no. <laughs> no, and so so I had this wonderful conversation at an OSCE conference with a with a lawyer who represents trafficking survivors from the Netherlands. So we were enjoying a glass of wine, and we were talking about restitution, as one does at these conferences. And and I said, well, you know, in the United States, the restitution is so infrequently collected. And she said, ah, in the Netherlands, we have solved that problem. I said, that's great. What do you do? She said, the restitution order is put in place by the court. And then the government has a certain amount of time to collect the restitution. And if the government can't collect the restitution within that window, then the treasury pays the restitution to the victim and the state is responsible for trying to get the treasury reimbursed. So I thought that was a fabulous idea. I brought it back to the United States and I said, let's do it the way the Dutch do it. Um, and it hasn't gone over very well in the United States. So, but, so there, are, there are models for how that compensation on the criminal side can be done. And, and I think what we've learned in the United States, for Islam, is that we just have to be much more engaged. You know, th this idea that um, if you delegate it to the prosecutors, it will take care of itself hasn't worked. And so now we are constantly both uh, trying to enforce those restitution orders ourselves by domesticating the judgment in local courts, but you need lawyers to do that, right? You need pro bono lawyers to do that. Survivors can't do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. And then we're also putting pressure on the Department of Justice to make sure that assets that the government forfeited are actually rerouted to survivors to pay restitution. So it's, the system is not perfect. And I would say that the system is not working, both because restitution orders are not ordered in all cases as they should be, but then also because the, 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 the payment is, is so difficult to collect. Now we, we have to be realistic, right? Because you can't get blood out of a turnip and it's impossible to collect money from defendants who are completely broke. And so you'll see some restitution orders that say, while this person is incarcerated, they have to pay $75 every three months, right? So, you know, if you're gonna end up paying a million dollar restitution order for back wages to someone you held in forced labor at $75 you know, every few months, it's gonna take a hundred years or more to pay that, right? It's never gonna be paid off. So the question then is, you know, if there's no money, if there's no money available for the defendant, how else can we find compensation for survivors? So there needs to be an alternative system of victim compensation that takes into account the fact that restitution is not always collectible. You mentioned, well, again, you call it something different in the US material witness, um, which I've, I found is very, very troubling in the US where uh, victims of trafficking are arrested and put in prison somehow for their own good and or and for protection and to secure their uh, testimony, which I don't think I've heard in Europe and even in in Asia where I've heard such uh, stories. Actually, the victims are put in shelter, which again yeah. is kind of like They're a detention. But yeah. at least, yeah, it's it's a lockdown, but at least it's not uh, a prison. So why is this possible in the US? And isn't there, I don't know, pressure to for prosecutors and police to stop doing that? So it's such an excellent question. And I totally agree with you that this is a, 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 an odd American disaster. And I'm not gonna say that it's thousands of cases because it's not. Um, you know, material witness warrants are not that common. But one of the reasons that we decided to write the report, uh, which was written by my colleague, Alexander Yelderman, um, and my colleague, Henry Wu, the reason we decided to write the report was because no one was talking about this, right? It, it, it hadn't actually bubbled up to the surface because people weren't seeing the trends and weren't seeing actually how common it was. And so I think, you know, what we tried to do in that report was, was channel research and channel hard data and hard case studies that would that would generate outrage because it's outrageous 
And it's also counterproductive, right? If you talk to trafficking survivors who've been incarcerated in regular juvenile justice settings or in prison settings in order to force them to testify, they are not interested in collaborating with the law, law enforcement authorities who imprisoned them. They are not interested in cooperating. And so the government does itself a tremendous disservice. And I also think it's a violation of the human rights of victims. Where in Palermo does it say that you can put a victim in prison to force them to testify? It's completely antithetical to the human rights norms that should be in place. You know, the material witness warrants piece is just one part of it. We still have victims being prosecuted in the United States. So at least a material witness warrant is temporary and just a hold. We actually have victims who are still being prosecuted. Years ago, Kate Mogulescu, another lawyer, and I went to visit in um, a city in Southern California. And we went to the public defender's office for juveniles. And we met with the juvenile public defenders who said that their children clients were cooperating with federal authorities in federal criminal sex trafficking cases. But the children needed public defenders because at the same time, the children were being prosecuted for prostitution by the city authorities. So we had two sets of prosecutors, the federal prosecutors treating these children as victims and the local prosecutors treating these children as criminals. And so the children had to have public defenders to defend them against the criminal prosecution at the local level. Right, that was a few years ago and things have changed largely because of Kate Mogulescu's efforts. But we're still in a position where we see se where we see trafficking victims and particularly sex trafficking victims prosecuted in the United States. If there's a victim who does not want to testify but identifies as a victim, then what happens to them? Do they just fall through the cracks? That's one. And two, might it not be that like this, this this situation that you've described, right? Like that the decision to testify is then in a way coerced because if they don't, then they're automatically classed as a as a perp as well or as a criminal as well. So they then have to embrace this victim identity. Like, is that not a concern? Let me start with the first question. You know, the the answer. I'll I'll give you the lawyer answer. It depends, right? <laughs> so, what happens to a survivor who doesn't want to cooperate? depends on multiple factors. Number one, are they foreign born? Do they need immigration status, right? If they need immigration status, they have to cooperate with law enforcement if they're an adult in order to get a T visa, in order to get continued presence, which is another form of temporary relief when you're cooperating with law enforcement. So there is, because again, we've been able to amend the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, there is a trauma exception, but boy, is that a high bar. Right, it's a very high bar to get the trauma exception. We worked really hard to make sure that children didn't have to report, right? Because children shouldn't be obliged to cooperate in order to get immigration relief. But we haven't been able to eliminate this quid pro quo of cooperation for adults, except in very, very rare cases. And so, you know, literally when you're filing a T visa application, you have to show that you cooperated. You have to provide proof of cooperation and you have to show that you have not refused any reasonable request. So what's a reasonable request, right? We have trafficking survivors wearing wires in criminal investigations, that's dangerous. If they're foreign born, they may fall through the cracks because they may not be able to get a visa without, without cooperating. If they're a US citizen survivor, Obviously, the government has less of a bludgeon <laughs> to force you to cooperate if you're a U.S. citizen survivor because they can't force you um, with, with threat of deportation. They can't sort of uh, compel you to cooperate because you're afraid you're going to have to return to your home country, which might actually be dangerous. So the U.S. citizen survivors are in a different place. And at the federal level, they're prosecuted, I think, less frequently because there are fewer laws that would be available to prosecute them. But state prosecutions, the states have an array of laws, including anti-sex work laws, and those laws make it easy to prosecute trafficking survivors. So I think what's happened is trafficking survivors who don't want to cooperate on, who are foreign born, are much more likely to fall into the sort of gray zone Right? They're much more likely to just sort of try and live in the United States in an undocumented gray zone. The US citizen survivors who refuse to cooperate 
are in much greater danger of getting prosecuted themselves because that's what prosecutors use to force them to cooperate. Right, which is again, why the criminal justice model has this inherent problematic system that is very hard to shed. So when, when you say, you know, the uh, US born citizens, you know, can't be forced to, to cooperate because they can't be deported, but are, would they be entitled to receive services, you know, counseling or legal support or, uh, you know, shelter if they need or unemployment support? Yeah, so Boris Law, that's interesting because that has really shifted over the last 10, 15 years. When we started this work in the United States, I think we all believed that all of the trafficking victims in the United States were foreign born, right? I, I think that's where we started. And then over time, organizations worked very hard to show that children who were in the sex industry were by definition trafficked, which is correct, right? There's no such thing as a child who is voluntarily in the sex industry. And so by definition, those children are trafficked. That raises sort of all sorts of questions. And in the beginning, the programs that were designed to combat trafficking in the United States, and particularly the benefits programs, were all designed for, for foreign-born victims. There, there are now many, many more services available for US citizen um, and green card holders, sort of people who are domestic victims of, of sex and, and labor trafficking. So there are more programs, there are more shelters available, there are sort of more benefits available, there are, um, there's definitely more awareness of that. But what happens actually is that trafficking victims are, are generally forced into the same broken systems that created the vulnerabilities in the first place. So child victims who are in the foster care system are then put back in the foster care system. I mean, we've had cases in the United States of people who are running shelters, government funded shelters in New York, it was just a terrible case. People who are running shelters, um, facilitating trafficking of children from those group homes, from those shelters. We had a case in Florida where the mentor on staff at a group home was actually taking children to a hotel to force them to provide sexual services to customers. So we have major, major problems with the foster care system and, and with um, assistance for children who are already vulnerable. And I feel like a lot of the services that are offered in the United States only reify that vulnerability and don't actually, don't actually assist. The, I, I should add that even for the foreign born victims though, the amount of money available for them is both skimpy and short term. And so it's a very kind of Scrooge like system where over a period of time, if you, you don't have to cooperate, you just have to be identified as a trafficking survivor by an NGO. If you, California is slightly better, but in most states, if you identify as a trafficking survivor, foreign born, and you go into the systems called TVAP, the TVAP system gives you a certain amount of money, it's only about $6,000, that can be spent on you to assist you over a very short period of time. So that's about six months. That's not very much money, number one. And number two, the period of time that it now takes to get a T visa has, has reached two years. When I started this work, it was between six months and a year to get a T visa. And now it's more than two years to get a visa. So you don't have work authorization. You only have this funding for a short period of time and it's extremely limited. So what are you supposed to do? for the other year and a half while you're waiting for a visa, right? You're supposed to live on fumes. You're supposed to, I have no idea. And the system does not actually deal responsibly with the fact that people need to be able to eat and live. And frankly, the trafficking survivors we work with need to be able to remit money home to their families who depend on them. 
do you have some sort of recommendations or how do you see anti-trafficking work moving forward from now? And uh, either we as part of a Biden administration or you know, regardless of uh, of the administration. I think that there is an international reckoning, quite apart from what's happening in the United States. I think there is an international reckoning of failure, right? An admission that this has failed as a model. You know, when you only have about 11,000 prosecutions in the entire world, that's the number from the Department of State report last year. If prosecution is your measure of success, then this has failed. And so I think there's a reckoning and a, and a real reevaluation of how we're going to deal with human trafficking in the future. So I have three recommendations. One is, and you know, Maria Grazi, who's the outgoing UN Special Rapporteur, has really put her finger on this. We need to deal with the entire continuum of exploitation, right? If, if you have a system that allows wage theft to continue un, untempered, unmitigated, you will probably have a system that allows a modern form of slavery to exist, right? Because we do have cases that are on the far end that are actually the ownership of human beings, right? Actual slavery cases. If you have a system that allows non-payment of wages and threats of deportation of workers, you will have forced labor and you will have involuntary servitude. And so the, 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 the criminal justice model is all about prosecution of the extreme cases. I think this new model will be all about bringing in people to do um, very serious uh, investigations of wage theft, of labor exploitation that doesn't rise to the level of human trafficking. I, I, think, I, I think we're moving away from this idea that the only thing that we're gonna do anything about is human trafficking and all of the other exploitation is really just fine, right? We can live with that. That's the first, I think we're, we're moving to a system where it's gonna be much more exploitation focused rather than focused on extremes. The second is, you know, my colleagues and I joke that forced labor in supply chains, forced labor in the international system is a feature and not a bug, right? This is the way the system is designed. It's not a, an aberration, it's not something that's gone wrong this is how it's supposed to work. And it's working beautifully for the people who profit off of it. And so I think we're now having a really uh, serious international reckoning also with kind of structural change and it's systems change. So it's not about playing whack-a-mole with individual prosecutions. It's actually about interrogating and changing entire systems and, and looking at structural change to make this uh, ameliorate to, to ameliorate human trafficking, and then the, the the third thing the third thing I'll say is, I think that there's a huge shift away. You know, Palermo brought us the three P's: prevention, prosecution, and protection. I think that there is a, a move away from prosecution and a focus on the most neglected P, which is prevention. And so I think this international reckoning will be all about investment in prevention so that we're not just trying to undo harm that has already been committed. So I see wonderful signs in the surge of interest in this work, um, halting human trafficking and all forms of labor exploitation with unions. I think that the surge of unions and workers' rights organizations and migrant workers' rights organizations into the trafficking sphere and the elimination of those particular silos is all to the good. So I'm optimistic, but I don't think that the strategy of doubling down on prosecutions is, is actually going to yield any success. Mm -hmm.